Hey, folks. Hey, everybody. All right, let's see. Who do we have? We got Hannah. We got CJ. Uh, we've got a couple more that we need to wait for to get a quorum. How about a kid's story, Matt? <laughs> kid's story? Oh, well. Yeah. I got Harper on my lap right now. So let's see here. Start video. Hi. Paparuski. <laughs> <laughs> so what's she doing? What's her where is she on the development thing? Well, she's just started crawling backwards, but that's I guess normal. <laughs> <laughs> so um right before this, uh right before the call started here, she was uh not too happy. I was uh, a little worried that uh Gonna have to talk in between her uh, making a lot of noise, but uh, as soon as the meeting started, she quieted down. Oh, cool! She's probably going, "What the heck's going on?" Yeah, look at all the people on the screen. Mm. All right, let's see here. We've got uh, Hannah, CJ, Ash, and myself. Um, Eric, uh, remind me again uh, how many. <clears throat> Um, I think we are good. It's four. Oh, very good. Well, it's 13072. It looks like a prison number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a prisoner. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing what we can do in prison these days. <laughs> I'm Mike, Mike Panel. From planning department, right? From Cheyenne. Uh, he's, he's from Cheyenne. He's, uh, he'll, he'll be here presenting on uh, topic number 4A, um, the historic tramway car. Um, I think I will give it just another minute longer. Let, uh, let's see, who do we still, so, um, Lauren is not going to be present. Okay. Um, so she's on paternity. <clears throat> Sorry, excuses, paternity. excuses. Um, and who else we, who else we missing? Melinda. Ah, Melinda. That's right. Let's give it a minute longer for Melinda to join. We're such a Gabby bunch, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I. It's, uh, how's everybody doing on a snowy evening? <clears throat> good work uh i told you i worked downtown at the hotel uh -huh. um and it was with the union station train all any cancellations they all just come downtown because it's an easy you know yeah. easy trip um so we actually got we picked up and we have people staying on property right now just to make sure we're all there come the morning. Oh, wow. Wow. Hey, there's Melinda. Hey, oh, Melinda. good. I was just calling you, Melinda. Cool. All right. Um, all right. Well, um, I think we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, the time is 6.34 p.m. Um, Eric, would you like to um, do roll call? Certainly. Uh, Chair Matt Crabtree. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Cash Parker. Here. CJ. Here. Melinda. Elsie. Here. Anna Miles. Here. And Lauren Cooper. I know she is going to be absent this month and next month. Um, she had her uh, a child. Which one? Number two. Is it a uh, boy, girl? Uh, I believe it's a girl. Oh, wow. And she told me she told me she was having a girl. Mm. Yeah. So uh, and then just noted that um, for staff, Eric Sampson and Brian Isom from Community Development are present, as well as uh, Victoria McDermott from the city attorney's office. All right. You take it away, Matt. All righty. Thank you. And for the record, we have uh, John Cox um, as a guest uh, and Mike Parnell. Is that correct, Mike? Proper pronunciation? 
Okay. That's fine. Yep. All right. Um, so they're they're uh, they're present from uh, the community, and uh, they'll be presenting on topic four. And uh, not seeing anybody else from the community tonight for a public forum, we will start with new business. Historic Denver Tramway Rail Car 319. John Cox, guest, and also Mike Parnell, guest. Hello. Uh, sorry to pop in there. Don't we need to do minutes first? Oh, yeah, I am. Jumped over that. Pardon me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was all excited about talking about car 319 here. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. Um, uh, agenda item two, approval of minutes, uh, draft. Uh, December 21st, 2022 minutes. Um, <clears throat> is there a, a motion to approve? I'll move to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Melinda. Is there any discussion, oh. amendments, changes? Okay. Not hearing any, I'll uh, um, call for the uh, vote. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes as written from the December 21st, 22nd, I'm sorry, December 21st, 2022 meeting. <clears throat> all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, those opposed? All right. Very good. Motion carried. Right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Now we can move on to agenda item four. Exciting. Uh, historic Denver Tramway Rail Car 319. Sorry, um, Harper. <laughs> um, historic Denver uh, Tramway Rail Car uh, 319. John Cox and Mike Parnell will present the history of this rail car, where it is currently located, its condition, and a potential opportunity for restoration. Included within the packet is some pictures um, and uh, of uh, the condition of it, the location of it, um, along with, I believe, some email correspondence that also uh, occurred. So I will hand it over to our guests tonight. I would assume that'd be uh, John. Would you uh, Would you like to take the, uh, take the presentation on that? Oops. Yeah, um, the car was, uh, was built in 1911. <clears throat> um, it operated uh, well, quite a, quite a bit. It spent most of its life <clears throat> operating on uh, South Broadway, University Park, uh, that sort of thing. It was, it, it was one of the very last cars that ran down to Inglewood, actually. <clears throat> it, uh, was, uh, it lasted right until the end, uh, June, June 4th, 1950. Um, it uh, uh, was, home, was based out of the South Division, which was at uh, Broadway in Alaska. Um, uh, it's, uh, I've, I supplied Matt with some, uh, some photographs of it back in the day. Uh, it was, um, and Mike, uh, has, has, I'm, I'm part of Mike and I are both part of the, uh, friends of the Ought for trolley, which has cosmetically restored the very, very last of the old streetcars that ran in, in Denver, uh, on the line out to Arvada. And back, it was uh, uh, ran on the interurban lines between our Denver and Arvada, Denver and Golden. And uh, he's he's got that car in his shop up in Cheyenne right now, pending the uh, development of the site there in uh, Arvada. <clears throat> and so, ideally, the same thing could be done for uh, Englewood, and it, thinking it would make a nice uh, complimentary display alongside the uh, uh, Cherry Lynn horse car. Uh, so the uh, well, the interior actually has these same kind of seats, or it would. This is this is what kind of seats were in the car, uh, but uh, um, I think Mike can can talk more about the condition of the car as it sits right now. The good news is, back in back when the last of the streetcars ran, Denver Tramway sold sold off the car bodies uh, for I think. I think it was like fifty dollars in 1950. You could buy yourself a car body. A lot of people hauled them away and uh, used them as chicken coops or tool sheds or summer houses. <clears throat> Quite often, they were put in rather protective locations. Sometimes even had houses built around them, which in in the long run preserved the original car body. Some of them were just dumped on the ground and they rotted away. There were quite a few of them outside of El Dorado Springs for years and years, and those are finally gone. They were just, they, they, were, they weren't preserved, they were just dumped there. Um, this car was put up on pedestals, and it, uh, 
still has uh, quite a bit of the under bracing or has the, you know, the under frame is still in pretty good condition. It still has the drops, all the drop sash windows. <clears throat> uh, the, it, it, uh, a lot of the exterior fittings, like the, what, what they call anti-climbers or which was a, uh, the same as a bumper on the, on a, on the street car are still there. Uh, uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, anyway, I can I, I think Mike can describe more about the uh, uh, the present location where it is in Casper. Yeah. So, um, hello to all. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a strange one because it's the to to date it's the furthest known um, location of a Denver trolley. It's up on Casper Mountain, which is um, about uh, 180 miles north of Cheyenne, and it's at about 9,000 feet elevation. So it's, uh, it's a, a rare survivor and a very strange story, really, in that it got sold around 1950, 51 maybe, and was taken up the mountain on the back of a four-wheel truck with chains around it and people sitting on the front so that it didn't tilt off the back of the truck which is kind of common for how they did things back then. They would accomplish things with, the, with limited means. Um, and I was made aware of it when we were restoring um, the trolley 04 for Arvada. I was made aware of this other trolley rumored to be on Casper Mountain. So because I'm always exploring and I'm always game for a, to try and find things, I went to look for it and found it up there and the first time I saw it it was covered in pretty much in waist deep snow so you couldn't really see a lot of it but it what was so amazing was its uh, state of preservation the fact that the yellow paint was still as good as the day it was taken up there you could read all the numbers on it um, and although it had additions of tin on the roof and roof patches and all sorts of other bits of wood had been attached to it in different places it still looked like it was in amazing condition um, and a lot of that is probably due to the elevation and the fact that it's in Wyoming, where we, we've recovered all sorts of railroad cars from Wyoming that have been on the ground for, you know, well over 100 years and they're still restorable. So, so I went to look at it again last year um, in the summer so that I could take a more detailed look inside and outside and we were able to lift the hatches on the floor to look under the floor as well at the frame and that kind of thing. And it, it looks fairly reasonable. It's sitting pretty straight on the ground, which is good. It's surrounded by very large trees now. Um, and uh, it has the addition of a, a stove and a hot tub in it, which is quite exotic, really. <laughs> so, uh, so that's his current condition. And I did share some photos with Matt, which he can share with all of you, showing how it looks as of right now. But um, having restored the 04, which took about two years, um, and it, it was in deplorable condition, probably the worst shape of any car I've restored, um, I think there's really good possibilities that we could do something really exceptional with 319. And, and I think personally that that would be an amazing, an amazing thing to do. 319 also has a little bit of historical significance in that it was the very first car to run after the after the first tramway strike in 1919, uh, so there's a picture of it pulling out of the Central Division car house on uh, 14th and Arapaho. <clears throat> so it's a little bit of historic uh, significance to the car. And and as far as it tying into Inglewood, it was 326 was the last made the very very last run down Broadway, but 319 was right there in that mix. So. <clears throat> I have a picture of it. Uh, uh, my dad worked for Denver Tramway. He worked there 42 years. So he, his career spanned 1929 to 1972, 71. And uh, he, so I, I kind of got all this by osmosis. I, well, I worked there myself for a while as well, but uh, I, have a, I have a pile of company magazines uh, from the mid forties to about 1951. And there's a really good picture that they shot um, <clears throat> covering the, uh, the, the transition from rail to rubber. And there's a, a trolley bus and, and a motor coach and the 319 right there. And they've got the number one guy on the seniority roster and the most recent guy that just, just hired out as an operator. And they're shaking hands and 
Uh, so there's there's a lot of photo documentation yeah. of it back back during its career. Um, and John, we had a great conversation um, on the phone what a couple of weeks ago, I guess, um, two three weeks ago. And uh, one of one of the interesting, sorry, one of the interesting <clears throat> things was um, the amount of documentation that you have, such as the the letter from General Motors. Do you want to talk about the letter from General Motors? That that fascinates me. The uh, you mean the one comp uh, congratulating Denver Tramway on their swift conversion uh, from from uh, streetcars to trolley coaches to, to 100 percent diesel bus in only five years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad was my <laughs> my dad missed the streetcars. He he thought that was a mistake getting rid of them, and but uh, you know that was that was the way things were then, and, and it was a private company and the. General Motors made him a heck of a deal, <laughs> so, but you know we're spending a gazillion dollars putting it all back. But anyway, yeah, I've got uh, I've got some documentation. I have a nineteen. I have a um another publication. I can I can uh, I'll get copied and I'll send it to you. It's it's uh, was done in nineteen forty seven when the when the company was still debating as to whether they wanted to keep some of the trunk line the busier lines. And the one on Broadway was was going to be one of those, and uh, they were um, uh, discussing, uh, you know, the, it goes into the economics and all that that sort of thing, and uh, uh, it's it's got a lot of a lot of pictures and and uh, some dialogue. It, the, the General Motors hasn't quite entered the the picture yet. Uh, the the following year, they suddenly decided that they were going to uh, convert it to all bus. Uh, probably because they've been paid a visit by some salesmen from General Motors, but uh, that could be another discussion, I suppose. <clears throat> All right. Um, so uh, I can go through the pictures here if you'd, uh, if you'd like, and uh, the, the ones that uh, Mike had sent over, I'll share my screen, and uh, you can kind of direct... Uh, let's see here. Where's that? Uh, let's go with that one right there. Uh, sure. Can everybody see the screen here with the the rail car? Yeah. So that's a that's a car that's currently down in uh, Colorado Springs. So if you move on about five or six photos, you'll come to the one we're talking about. There we go. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so that's 319 as it sits right now, pretty much. So the the, the guy that owns it, we've we've had a one or two chats with him. He's unfortunately one of those people that thinks everything is worth something, which was kind of disappointing because I work on the principle that if we're going to try and save something, then it should be donated. Um, but but you know there it is. I mean it's it's still an amazing piece of history that. Uh, one way or another I feel personally that we ought to try and at least save and have somewhere where it's available and not suddenly find out that it's been destroyed which is unfortunately what can happen so so that's the the door side of the trolley as we can see right there at this Real point quick, how did this come to to your attention what did he put a note out saying I'm selling it or no it, um, it came I think it came via Pete West who's one of the trolley um, association members I think he knew of its whereabouts and he told me and so I went looking for it and at that time um, it wasn't owned by this guy um, but then I got in touch with him via another by the by the neighbor and uh, he said well come and have a look around it if you want to and that was last year so uh, he kind of got it, it's descended through his family, if you like, and, and he's the current owner. What he did tell me um, when I spoke to him last week is that he's selling the land with the trolley on it to a, a guy from Dem from uh, Texas. Now, how serious that is, I don't know, but he's willing to, to, to hold off on selling um, the land and the trolley until we could perhaps give him some idea of what might, might happen to the trolley itself. Um, now it's possible if he sells the land and the trolley that we can then talk to the new owner because apparently the new owner doesn't like the color yellow apparently so well, that's a possibility. <laughs> I don't know, but, um, you know that's a possibility but what worries me is that the land gets sold and the new owner then destroys what's on it um, but 
you know, it may it may hang around for a long time, and this guy also may be bluffing me a bit as well. But um, but it, we had a good conversation last week about it, and he would be willing to sell the trolley body if we wanted to move it off the mountain. What is he looking at? Uh, he was looking at about twenty thousand dollars. Are you serious? Yeah. So and then and I, and I did explain to him. Moving it. I did explain to him it's going to cost at least that to get it off the mountain. Um, you know, so but but there we go. That's you know he he wants money for it, and that's that's the way these things go. Sometimes it may be that in time we can, you know, talk him to, around to a bit more sense um, a, about it. But that's anyway. That's where we are at the minute. Okay. Um... There's some interior pictures as well that you can see. Sure. Um, I'll uh, just direct me through and I'll. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Keep moving on. This is the other end of the trolley. Uh, interesting that the wood on the end is in amazing condition as well. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe the condition of, of everything. But if you look at the, uh, can you back up one? Look at the um, the area around the bottom, the uh, what's called the anticlimber, the bumper. You'll notice that there's a slope bit of uh, sloped sheet metal on on the bottom that was purposely put on the back end of all of Denver Tramway streetcars to keep people from riding back there. <laughs> it, kids would hitch a ride. <clears throat> uh. That's the uh, the ladder there for getting onto the roof. You can see the rings that they would stand on to climb onto the roof um, in the uh, pre OSHA days, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then it has a lot of the original lettering inside clearly visible. It's been very, very unmolested. It's even got the original ceiling panels in there. Um, it has window uh, window shades, which we've never seen before. We never had any of those with the other trolley. Um, and if you look at the cab roof, which is in the bottom of that picture, the actual wood on the cab roof looks in exceptional condition as well. That's usually the first thing to go on a, yeah. on, a, on a streetcar because especially, and that's harder, that's the hardest thing to replicate because of the compound curves on that. Okay. So this was a shot that I took under the floor when we lifted the one of the uh, motor panels where the trucks would have been. It doesn't have trucks, obviously this trolley, which none of them did. They were never sold off with trucks because that's where the money was from, from a scrap merchant's point of view. So it shows that it's sitting on round logs by the looks of it. Um, and it's there's a couple of photos after this that show the frame condition, which doesn't actually look too bad. They had a steel frame with wood inserts in it. Well, your condition, your statement of it doesn't look bad is so different than mine. I'm yeah, I'm I'm always very positive, <laughs> but uh, no, it doesn't. It really doesn't look bad at all, considering what we've seen with uh, other trolleys and other railroad cars. This is this looks fairly good to me. What is this uh, tubing here? Is that is that those like are cables, probably cables that ran to the motors, that those kind of thing. The, yeah, those are for the traction motors. The previous photo showed four uh, four traction motor connection leads. Um, yeah, yeah those those are those are connectors for the traction motors. Oh. That's some of the steel work underneath, which again doesn't look uh, too desperately bad. And this is one of the bolsters. This is where the trucks would actually sit down down at the bottom right hand corner there. Or let yeah right hand corner there's uh, left hand corner sorry there's the the ring that the truck actually sat in when it was uh, when it was on wheels so that's the main structural component and then the windows have their original latches on them and uh, and lifts which is really unusual as well and hard to find very hard to find stuff like that that exists. When they used these, did they have screens or did they just use glass? They just had just, just, just plate glass. glass. <clears throat> yeah. And that's a that's um, 
the uh, city cars in, in there, most of them had what's called a drop sash window. So to open that window, um, you would first push up on the, the top, the brass fitting on the top to lift it up high enough to where you could open a little, a little hatch that, in the bot for the, that uh, opened up a, a pocket in the car body in the wall, and then the window shit, the window pane itself would drop down into the the uh, the pocket, oh. and you can kind of yeah that yeah you can see the pocket there you can yeah, see yeah you the, can see the lid the lid yeah <clears throat> yeah and there's a leather strap that's on the bottom, typically on the bottom of the windows uh, that helps you lift it up, and then it would you kind of pull it in a little bit, and then and then it would drop down. And the uh, those car body pockets were convenient receptacles for gum wrappers and, and old transfers and things like that. Yeah, we found uh, we found tickets and season tickets on the zero four down in those pockets. It was like a, a really good archaeological dig <laughs> down in there, if you like. And these are the window shades, which are I've, I've never seen one. I've never we only had the rollers left on the other trolley and I've never seen a window shade. You can see the pattern on it and everything. Absolutely amazing. But with the um, the wood here, um, I've, I've not seen varnish do that before. What is the, um, what's, is that water coming in? Or? No, it's not. It's, um, I think it's the, uh, the varnish they used to use on them that, that would do that over time. Um, varnish, uh, varnish breaks down, it'll, first it'll turn dark and then it and then it dries out and you and essentially you get what you see here. So the that cars, would all, that would all scrape off and and you'd be back to the original wood ready to sand and revarnish. So it's actually a good <clears> thing <throat> that it's got so much varnish on it. Yeah, the cars used to go in for for annual or for, for uh, maintenance about every about every five years. They would get revarnished on the inside. They'd get a new paint job, uh, that sort of thing. There's probably a fair bit of varnish on there. Oh, oh yeah, many layers. Many I layers. have a I have a seat from a from a Denver a Denver streetcar, and it had it. I stripped it and re-varnished it when I first got it, and it was it had so many coats of varnish on it, it was actually green. <clears throat> so, did this have any any seats left or no? No, that there aren't any seats. Um, the the interesting thing is that when we uh, got zero four. It came with about seven really poor conditioned seats. And during the course of talking to friends of mine on Facebook, we came across a guy in Strasbourg, Colorado, who had a barn full of Denver trolley car seats. Um, and he had 34 of them. So we bought all of them. So uh, zero four has a full complement of seats, but I also have an awful lot um, of seats left over that could go in this one to at least illustrate how it would have looked. There may not be enough for all of it, but we have we do have a lot more seats that could go in this one. So that was an amazing find. I mean, you just you don't come across things like that these days very often. Well, maybe I'm being a little impatient, but let's just pretend we don't have to pay twenty thousand. Yeah, mm -hmm. buy it. Let's just pretend the next uh, owner is like, yeah, you know what? Go ahead, take it, and maybe we can give them some sort of tax credit, you know, that kind of thing. But twenty thousand to move it, like you said, to even get it off the hill. You mean even to get it to Inglewood or to your shop? To Cheyenne, I, I think I think we could do it for less. Um, I like to say that because we would we wouldn't get a company in to do it. We would do it ourselves because we know from experience how to lift these things without bringing in cranes and without bringing in um you know semi-trailer trucks and things like that we've we've done this before in a much better method with much better methods than calling in a large company to do anything with it so it may be less than that but i would i would have to say that just as an outline an outline figure because casper is you know it is 180 miles from here there's a lot of equipment to take up there and a lot of stuff to bring back so, and this is your business. <laughs> I run, yeah, I have a nonprofit that I that I run. So we have some railroad cars that belong to the nonprofit that we saved, and then I have a business as well, uh, restoring cars for for other museums and things also. So looking at this, all in all in the bucket of just that isn't even getting it to Inglewood. What would you say to recoup it? Um, well, 
I, I can go by the 04. The 04, which was done um, two years ago now, in the end, I think cost about $260,000. Um, you have to remember that the 04 did come with trucks and wheels, although they're not correct. It did already have those. Uh, whereas with something like this, unless it's put on the ground and the, the wheel area is hidden, so you don't see that it doesn't have wheels, it would have to have some kind of wheels built for it, which wouldn't be too bad. So I think you're looking at around the same kind of figure, maybe maybe nearer the 300,000 to, to rehab something like this. This one looks to me as though it's in actually better body shape than the 04. So they, we may not have to dig into this one as much as we did with that one. Um, so it, it's difficult to say without a detailed analysis of it, but I, it, it looks pretty good to me. And But it would be that type of thing, not necessarily a volunteer thing. It would be a contract paid. It, yeah, you would have to be a contract thing. If it was a volunteer thing, I think it would take so long that, um, you know, I don't think it would be kind of feasible to to do it on a volunteer basis i have so few well i don't have any volunteers that's how few i have and so you know i try and do everything non-profit wise myself with help from people that i've conned and uh and the rest is you know is, is business stuff so so i think you'd have to do it as a contract so and what's um, this this is uh this is zero four right or no, no this is uh this is a car in uh, linwood washington Oh, that's uh, an urban car that's been restored. Uh, that's the that's the pavilion that it's in. Wow, this is similar and, to the building that Arvada are going to build, but it's the Arvada building is a lot simpler and it's more of a gazebo type building over the trolley. That, but the same, right, the I'm same sorry. idea. The truck right there is very similar to. Uh, now that was fabricated for that car, and that's that's uh, this exact same kind of a truck that that the uh, three nineteen had or could have underneath it and that can be fabricated pretty easily um but i they, assume not, i assume not cheaply though yeah I, I don't know what exactly that you know i could probably find out what they paid to get that done but that that's the kind of thing that we could do in-house but it it may not you know that the ultimate display area may not require trucks and wheels even um that there's a trolley in the forney museum that's on the ground but it's disguised so that it's you don't know that it doesn't have wheels on it because you walk on up some steps into it and you can't see it. So it's not always necessary to go that far if you don't want to. But do you uh, do you have any pictures of the the car um, um, that you restored for Arvada? Uh, I do. Yeah, I can send you some. Um, I don't have any right here right now unless uh, I should have come out at six o'clock. John's got some. Okay. But I'll send you some that you can distribute. Okay. Um, yeah, that'll uh, that'll work. Um, I was going to be out there doing the the interview out there, but it's so freezing cold, I would have died before we'd finished. So, <laughs> it's in a missile silo, so you would have been preserved too. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we could just put you on display. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> um. I'll make sure that the pictures that you sent via the Dropbox are um, included for the record with the meeting. Okay. I'll get those over to Eric. Um, there's also other pictures in there, so it'd be good to have that as part of um, as part of the meeting or official record. Um, so, I mean, this is all fascinating, right? And um, also all very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is something that we would better have to understand, you know, to present to likely to city council and or city management to understand what the, the cost and implications could be. Um, and I would I would expect that this would be a situation and I would I imagine Arvada was probably in the same same boat. Um, but uh, I, I doubt this would be a situation where the, the city would be able to cover that entire amount, if right. any, if any. I mean that we have to consider the, the the possibility that the city may not be able to contribute any amount of money to this. So if that's the case, you know, in those scenarios, what options would there be? Well, yeah, how was the funding? Yeah, so with Arvada, they um, it came up on um, the 10, 10 most endangered places in Colorado list. Eventually, this was after many years of trying to fundraise for it by a volunteer group. 
it came up on the 10 most endangered places. And that's when it got um, grant funding. And that's when Arvado had to have a matching, a matching amount to, to the grant to, to complete the work. And that's how that's it got that. on. Um, I don't know what, I don't know anything about the grant details, to be honest, how much they were. Um, Kim, Kim Grant with his appropriate name would be able to tell you that. Um, <laughs> Because he dealt with the the grant funding and all that kind of stuff, so he would know. But uh, that's how it basically came to the attention of Arvada and how it finally got the the money that it it deserved and needed after all these years. Okay. Um, so we, there, we would also pursue grants from like uh, History Colorado and uh, yeah, right. That, well, that's where yeah. well, Kim Grant cool. is is the Saving Places person, right? Well, he's retired now, I think, as well, hasn't he? Yeah. He still, he still no. helps us. I believe so, yeah. Yeah. But uh, he still helps a lot. He's very enthusiastic with, about all this stuff. Yeah, you, could, you could definitely pick his brain. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Wally Wirt would be another another good resource. Uh, he's, he's the guy that originally bought the, the car body and kind of got every the project rolling initially. So. Yeah, if it hadn't been for Wally, the car would have been burnt. Um, years ago at the Forney Museum and destroyed by them. Destroyed by the Forney Museum? Yeah, yeah, they were they were getting rid of all their old car bodies that they had outside and and zero four was one of those. Oh, no. oh wow. Um, so uh, what about getting uh, car 319 on some sort of, you know, endangered places if there is if there is risk of it being demolished? I know that the um, History Colorado has yearly the nominations for that, and we're past that right now. But uh, um, is there any opportunity to get this on endangered places for the time being um, to try to drum up some attention and, and support? I, I would think so. I don't know anything about what their current <clears throat> projects are and what their future projects are, but I think. I think it would be good to at least start the process mm -hmm. so so that there is some chance of it getting on there. Okay. I agree. Um, I wonder, Matt, I mean, just like, where would it go? <laughs> well, actually, um, uh, Mike and I had a conversation just right before this and, and, you know, City Center is going through its redevelopment planning right now. Um, while maybe not historically accurate location, um, specifically in city center, but if there is there has been a very strong interest in in tying history in with the city center development, specifically history with the uh, Alexander Industries Aviation, um, with Cinderella City, you know the the previous malls, um, you know, and I, I think this something like this would be a really interesting showcase kind of center. You know, area some some something to draw interest or or, um, I guess, uh, some sort of just level level of interest to the to, to development. So, um, I don't know, just an idea. Obviously, that it would just involve, seems like you have to have someone that has passion. You know, I mean, not only passion but time to just get this word out to coordinate the grants, to even just take everything that John and Mike have, present it, you know, a fund me page. I, you know, I mean, all I can think of is 150,000 minimum. Yeah, it's gonna be- Well, and there's the um, owner of the depot. Um, oh, we won't get anything from him. Yeah, he's, he's got his own troubles right now. Um, yeah, he's he's being sued by the city, so I doubt he's <laughs> interested. Yeah. <laughs> Chances are, yes, his priorities are, yes. Um, I mean, I could I, see where um, Lauren might help us with Department of Transportation, you know, um, or, yeah. uh, through Colorado, maybe, you know, some of their grant stuff. You know, I mean, I can see where all these pieces could come together, but it's almost like you know, this guy talking, I mean, 20,000, forget it. It ain't going to happen. And so my yeah. whole thing would be, is he, is he selling to a Texan? We'll just 
play on the emotions of the Texan. I mean, well, uh, yeah, and that's true. He may well then suddenly come down in price, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, but even then, five thousand. I mean, just like, I mean, I know I mean, the it, historic it, society had some money, but uh, if it came down to to five thousand or even ten, I would consider just letting him have the money and doing it myself and just saving it because my my worry is that that he'll he may be bluffing us but he, he also may sell the land and then the owner will just get rid of it or, or we may not find out who the owner is even and it's gone so if it comes oh, down no, to we can always it, find out the owner i would try and do it you know myself is wyoming that secret to where you're not that trans you're not that oh yeah no it's, it's fairly transparent i think oh you can find out but well, um, i mean to to it would be risky to because there is a lot of history there and, and personally I mean, you know, I'd love to see this car preserved myself personally, you know, um, not anything official, you know, for the commission on that, speaking on anybody else's behalf, speaking on my own, I'd love to see this car restored in a, in a unique bit of history in Inglewood, especially considering Inglewood had such a um, um, importance with the tramway company, you know, that when you know, the, the loop apartments, I don't know if you're aware, but on Broadway, you know, there used to be two tracks that went down Broadway and um, the tramway cars would turn around at what is now, you know, right next to the surplus store and right along the side of the surplus store would come around and then come back down the uh, Broadway from the other direction. Inglewood has a lot of its, uh, the success of its, um, you know, the business district on the 3400 block of Broadway can you know, really, um, its success was largely because of a the um, tramway company and the cars, you know, turning around there. Um, but then, you know, just I don't know. It's there's a lot of history associated with this at Inglewood, and it's, it'd be great to be able to save this, and specifically a car that used to transit Inglewood. Is that right, um, John? Yes, and Mike. Yeah. Was so, this like that, Melinda? Was this like the place you were talking about? Went up to Loretta Heights. Is that three nineteen? No, because that was another horse car. Oh, actually. Loretto Heights? Yeah, there was actually a, a horse car that went across um, what is now Hamden um, to uh, uh, take students to Loretto Heights. And it wasn't the Cherry Lynn horse car. It was, uh, I forget what it was called, but... Uh, there was actually another horse car for... Uh, like from like 1890 to 97 thereabouts okay yeah yeah well the, there was the the tramway made a connection with another company called the denver and south platte right there at <clears throat> at uh, uh right around their track ended around gerard and the tramway looped around there south of hampton so he, he made a connection right there in, in broadway for another line called the Denver and South Platte, which ran down to Littleton, okay. and uh, that that quit running in 1926. But the the two of the cars that they owned are, are now preserved at in the Seashore Trolley Museum in in, uh, in Maine, yeah. restored back to their original livery and all. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean that Broadway was the, was the main artery for getting back and forth to Denver, downtown Denver, and other other places. Yeah, there's, um, uh, CDOT has an actual uh, study that they did of the various uh, streetcars and uh, mapped it out on uh, where you can look at the different layers uh, through the years and so forth. And that's where I discovered the um, uh, that other horse car. Um, and uh, it it only, I think it was actually owned by uh, Loretto Heights College, but uh, that was pretty to common. Deliver their students. Yeah, that was pretty common back in the when street railways were first expanding. Uh, Denver, the Denver area was no exception. The, the uh, <clears throat> there were all kinds of little companies that would spring up, like the the Park Hill Railway Company and the East Colfax Electric Railway, and and um, uh, actually. The line on Broadway was one of the very first electric streetcars that ran, and it ran from uh, what was at that time a station uh, on Broadway in Alaska down to uh, Inglewood to the south, 
And then at Broadway in Alaska, they transferred to cable cars. Uh, and, and that ran until 1900. But one of the very first electric streetcar lines ran between Broadway and Alaska and, and uh, uh, Broadway and, and Hampton uh, in 1890. So when that started, I have a picture that came out of my dad's office, actually. He retired as the superintendent of transportation just before RTD uh, <clears throat> made its appearance. And uh, he was an assistant superintendent at the South Division uh, at, at one point. And he noticed uh, when they got rid of South Division in 1955, he uh, he uh, liberated that picture from uh, from the office. And uh, so um, I can, in fact, I if you want, I can send you some copies of that. It's kind of an interesting. It was shot in 18. It was shot in 1890. You can see the Broadway electric car in the background. Um, but yeah, a lot of history there. That's interesting. Boy, John, I don't where know. do you live, John? I live in Seattle now. Uh, how do you go on? I don't know if this will work, but this is a picture of 04 as it is finished. Oh, there you go. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. So that's it that's right beautiful. now, basically. That is amazing. Yeah, it was it was amazing from the wreck it was to to what it is now. There's uh, another shot there, just a oh. I mean, we're, we're looking at this, and and when we right. discussed this briefly at the previous meeting, I, I I did make mention that it seems there's a lot of optimism here with the, <laughs> the preservation of this car, but um, I uh, I do understand the history of it. Um, it's I I'm I can't I can't say anything personally myself about what the next steps will be. No, right, of course. Um, it's but, just really really making people aware of it because before it's too late you know yeah. and that's that's what we're going to try and do and we'll try and save it regardless you know whatever happens we'll try and save that car body but it but it needs to go where where it was used <laughs> so. i think we're, so let's go around the, the the virtual room we have here cj do you have any other questions uh, yeah hey mike so you made an a comment of getting it yourself you know if it was for five or ten and fixing it up yourself and then no i wouldn't i wouldn't fix it up myself i just make oh. sure that we've got control over it i see i don't have time to fix things up i've got cabooses from 1870 i've got pullman cars from 1887 um you know i just have so much stuff to do uh for myself that i, I wouldn't do it i just my, my biggest fear is that the body gets destroyed and if it's at my facility and and i've got control over it then it's safe I haven't started yet. They, that's, that's, they need you know, that's kind of what I meant. Okay. Um, uh, Cash, do you, uh, do you have any uh, questions or comments? Uh, I don't. It was an informative presentation. I appreciate you both coming and telling us about mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Sorry, we don't have any money. We don't have any money <laughs> to help you <laughs> do it. That's Otherwise, absolutely I'd, normal. <laughs> if we did, I'd vote in favor of giving it to you yeah. to go get it. That's absolutely normal. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Melinda? I was uh, remembering a streetcar story that I knew, but um, uh, it isn't to do with this one. It's, uh, John, you probably, you mentioned the, the uh, East, uh, East Denver or whatever that... Uh, He's I was told by somebody that uh, a streetcar ran out um, Montview to Peoria to the front gate of Fitzsimmons, uh, the army base, at, which, and it was basically to serve the army base. And it, all through World War II, at least, it ran uh, there and I guess until they converted to uh, rubber tired buses. Actually, the line... Um... <clears throat> The line originally uh, ran to uh, uh, Galena Street or, or uh, uh, Geneva Street, and uh, it, it ran out of Colfax to Geneva until 1932, and they uh, replaced it with a bus. Um, there was a, a company called the Fitzsimmons Bus and Taxi Company that started in in right about World War One. I'm thinking about 1917 or 18 to to um, <clears throat> connect with the streetcars on Geneva Street to the, the newly formed uh, uh, Fitzsimmons Hospital. And, and they, uh, that lasted until 1932. 
when the line was cut back to Poplar Street. And that was, uh, that lasted until 1950. There was a, <clears throat> the, the line came out Colfax to Poplar Street and there was a loop right there where, where they connected with uh, the line to Lowry Air Base at Fitzsimmons and uh, what was called the Montclair line, which went up uh, to uh, 23rd and, and you know made a little loop around there. But uh, yeah, that, it, it didn't last until World War II. It, uh, the, the Aurora, it was still called the Aurora line, even though it only went as far as Colfax and Poplar. But mm -hmm. um, the uh, actual streetcar operation never went any farther east than uh, Geneva Street. Ah. Well, the person who told me the story was uh, remembering World War II, so I guess that she got confused. <laughs> but... Yeah, they had there were there was as you can imagine there were they had a lot of traffic from there and Lowry and Buckley uh, <clears throat> with with uh, people in the military uh, going into town and back. So uh, yeah, yeah, that Aurora was a largely military town as that uh, in those days between yeah. all of the different bases. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, Hannah, if you, uh, um, do you have any questions? Um, <coughs> um, I do not. I really enjoyed the, the presentation, though. Um, and like everybody else said, if we have a choice, I, I want to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, no, I think it's it was really interesting, and I really appreciate the time you took to share that with us and to find it. Um, yeah, personally, I I want to see it restored. I want to see it here. <laughs> um, and I, I, I have two teenage boys. I I see these things, and all I want to do is be able to show it to them physically, so they can know, yep. you know, our history. So no, it was really really exciting. Um. You know, I, I don't know, Eric or Brian, you know, you, you've been listening in on this. I know you're from a staff perspective on this, but I don't know if it's breaking protocol or not, but I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to to jump in or make mention if you have any questions. And um, now I can hop in for a second. So I did forward the information that um, Lauren had provided me over to the uh, community um, community development director, Brad Power, and he did have a, a conversation with Sean about this. And what they came back with was kind of what has already been talked about tonight. It's kind of like the larger scope of the project. What would it entail? What would the costs be? Uh, and they also came back with um, what would be a publicly accessible city property, property location. Um, those are just as the, as the couple items that, uh, to, to think about because off the top of their heads they couldn't think of any obviously ob an obviously public publicly accessible place for the location well okay well that's that, that's Wouldn't like it make a great restaurant oh that'd be so oh. cool <laughs> i was actually thinking that when we first saw the picture my i my first thought was like like a food truck right um, something that right. to restore it into something that's um, useful useful and accessible right. for the next generation so and that's actually going to want to come that's, that's possible too it doesn't have to be historically absolutely correct and just static it could be yeah it could be something like that that's usable for some purpose well, like a rapo wakers it's the facade right. do you remember facade. do you remember the um double decker bus that used to be on 16th street by the clock tower yeah there was a red a red double decker bus there they sold tickets from for concerts and things and and that was another another option you know another kind of idea because that bus ended up with me i have that one oh cool um, <laughs> up here so i have saved some denver history Yay. but um but yeah that's it's another option isn't it that you could make it functional for something as well to pay its way you know so i know this isn't related but uh mike um are you aware of the uh, uh double decker electric trolleys that go through hong kong I've seen them. Yeah, I have seen them in photographs and things. Yeah, I, I've actually gotten to write, on, write them on them right. a couple of times with my travels over the years. And yeah. uh, that was amazing. amazing. Yeah, amazing system. Yeah. Are they tall enough, Matt? <laughs> uh, they are. They are. It's actually just, it's. It, they look very, very similar to the this rail car on the inside. They're all wood framed. And mm -hmm. uh, it's got a spiral staircase at the backside that you go up. And 
and you can sit on the top level. You can stand up there, and they're, they're, they call them ding dings because it never <laughs> stops. The spell goes ding ding. <laughs> but those hey, are still John. running oh. after a hundred years. Sorry. No, but don't I, be. I'm the one interrupting. Hey, John. So, in your travels around, have you run across anyone in the Denver metro area that seems to have a passion for this type of thing? The Denver Tramway Historical Society that runs the Platte Valley Trolley would probably be a resource. Uh, there's people <clears throat> involved with the museum in Golden. Uh, <clears throat> there's also the, uh, the group in uh, Lakewood that has the um, uh, car 25 that uh, only runs like, it only comes sees the light of day like a couple of times a year, I guess. But- uh, uh, Is car 25 what they show over at the federal buildings? Yes, that's right. Six? Federal center, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is, there are, there are a lot of people that are interested in this sort of thing. Yeah, it's it's not it's it's not that arcane yeah. really. Um, so um, <clears throat> I think, you know, if the word got out that that this was that there was a possibility that this could be, you know, restored, put on display, or whatever, uh, I think I think uh, a lot of people would would uh, show up to to uh, support it. Mike, my heart just crushed when you said you don't have time to do it. What do you have colleagues that you would recommend? No, I do. I would have time to do it if it was a contract. I would have time to I do see, it, but, see, but see, not voluntarily because I have, right, right, right. I have okay, too much other it. stuff I've saved. Meaning if you do. got it for 5,000, it would sit there. Is That's what right. We could, okay. we could put it on a frame. We would have it, you know, leveled up on a frame. It would sit there quite happily and I would cover it up. I so see. It, would, it wouldn't deteriorate. Aww. So... Um, now there's, um, and uh, the name's escaping me right now, but there's an organization outside of Colorado Springs, and the guy has a railroad track that goes around his property. Pikes Peak, Pikes Peak Railroad Historical Society, or yeah, Society, like yeah. That. they've have got some tramway on, equipment down there as well. Have you been in contact with those uh, those folks on this? Because I know that they they do restoration of um, yeah, they have Holden cars. Yeah, yeah, they have trolleys and they, they restore trolleys and that kind of thing. But I think they're, they're fully involved with what they have and they don't do anything as far as contract work goes um, that I'm aware of. And it's um, it, it's a fairly elderly bunch of people that work on those and in their spare time. So it's not something I don't think that they would take on as a, a, as a project. In I fact, I bought, I bought my bus from them because they didn't want it. So I got my bus for a dollar off of them. Oh, wow. just to save that so um you know they've they're very selective about what they take and what they don't and what they can do sure i was just looking at this from the standpoint of you know the broader reach um you right. know, as possible if there's if there's any other organizations so i think this is really informative i, I very much appreciate the information um i think uh, i think it deserves more discussion um i you know to eric's point it's something that you know somehow some way we need to get to a point of what the scope looks like what mm -hmm. is this, what is this going to look like to get it off of the property and get it down to you know some sort of shop where it can be done right what are the, what are the milestones the time frames the costs associated with doing it um is there any opportunity for grant funding to come in from the state of colorado or from the historic funds the uh, various historic funds or scfd um is there a volunteer opportunity here where something could be, you know, there could be a contri contribution of time for people that are, because I, I can guarantee you there's a lot of people in Inglewood. We, we, we're we very historically centered community. Uh, right. And uh, I, I, I could, I could bet that there's a number of people that would be interested. I'm myself being one of them of, you know, helping to restore a lot of this and potentially saving on some of the costs associated. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's that yeah. idea of that passion, though, to, to coordinate the, the grants and the people's, you know, that's the part. I Not to be to, a negative I, I would definitely talk to Kim. I was going to say, that. I was going to talk, we can talk to Kim. Yeah. And, and uh, bounce that off of him because yeah. he, he'd be a good resource for that. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I, I have... I have yeah. a lot of technical data on the cars and, and I can I, I can certainly help in supplying fittings and you know parts like that <clears throat> so uh but yeah we, we can we'll bounce this off of kim 
Okay. And John, from a preservation standpoint of the documentation you have, um, the Inglewood Public Library has a wonderful archive of pictures and documentation and things like that. Like, for instance, Inglewood had the um, uh, General Ironworks and a lot of the documentation and things from General Ironworks that were scanned in and put on the Inglewood, um, you know, Public Library's photo archive. It would be fantastic to, if you'd be willing to contribute, you know, the um, digital images uh, to have that available to you know the public through through the city's you know, uh, photo archive um or you know even contributing to the local historic society and 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 so that they could have access to that also i'm not sure if that interests you or not yeah yeah uh, just before rtd took over my dad and i went through the office and grabbed everything that said denver tramway on it <laughs> so <laughs> And, and John, you and I, uh, we, we also talked, uh, obviously, and, and there's a connection. My great, or my grandfather uh, worked for Sioux City Transit uh, for over 40 years. And uh, there's a good chance that he, um, there was a similar network apparently in Sioux City of, of tramway cars. And he may very well have, have uh, worked on a tramway car, probably highly likely. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I can't thank you guys enough for taking the time and sharing your enthusiasm with us and your work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, folks. Um, if you want to, you can, you're welcome to stick around for the rest of the meeting. Obviously, this is a public meeting, so you're welcome to stick around. Um, but uh, uh, we wouldn't be allowed to do any further comment um, after we close out this, this sure. talk. So. Well, thank you for listening to us. And uh, we'll try our very best to do what we can you know with saving this somehow okay so. well thank you very much okay thank you thank you thank you, you soon bye. thank you very much bye okay and uh we're moving on to the next agenda item um and uh of course i lost the agenda here where is it at all right um next agenda item is agenda item five old business title 16 working session <laughs> i'm sorry I just said drum roll. Drum roll, <laughs> yes, exactly. Drum roll. Uh, Title 16 working session with Inglewood City Attorney. Um, included within the packet is the red line um, uh, information. Thank you for, um, Eric, thank you for including that within the packet. Um, and I will hand it over to, uh, unless Eric, do you, do you want to, do you have any other information on this that you want to introduce first, or should I just hand it over to uh, uh, Deputy uh, City Attorney? I, I think we're probably good to let Vicki take it away. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to uh, hand things over to uh, uh, Victoria McDermott, uh, Deputy City Attorney. Um, very much appreciate you coming tonight. And uh, um, you have the floor. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, so you know, these are the proposed changes to Title 16 um, that were originally um, well, I think last went to council back in 2021, but as you may recall, that was um, delayed uh, due to the Title 16 code rewrite project. There was a decision to um, include 16-6-11 uh, within that overall rewrite. Um, so what you have in your packet um, is pretty much um, the same language as what was proposed in 2021. Uh, the changes in red were what, uh, what the changes that were, were proposed um, back then. What's in blue um, are just some minor changes that our office has uh, suggest, suggested that we make as well. Um, these changes are based primarily on the model ordinance that is put out with um, history, the History Colorado Certified Local Government Preservation Ordinance. And I'll share my screen so we can all look at it together. Just bear with me as I do that. So I've got that up now um, to kind of go over uh, these changes. Um, again, everything in red was made back in uh, 2021. The changes in blue are, are what our office is now suggesting. Um, and again, just based off of what the, the that model ordinance uh, suggests be included. A couple of questions are included in here for the commission, uh, including 
Um, as you'll see here, this first comment regarding whether or not staff should be involved in the application process. Um, that's something uh, we would recommend that staff is involved um, for other areas uh, within the city staff is involved and we just recommend that change for consistency with our approach and our process. And then um, additionally, you know, with making these changes, there would need to be corresponding changes made to other sections of the municipal code regarding um, the makeup and membership of the commission, as well as the powers and duties of the commission to make clear that these are now the powers and duties. Of note, um, to the extent that the commission uh, and the city choose to go for a certified local government uh, designate, uh, designation and seek that approval. Um, there are certain requirements that we would need to include uh, under federal and state statutes uh, regarding uh, what the membership composition would be. Um, for instance, um, the state requires that 40% of the commission would be made up of professionals with experience in history, architecture, landscape, architectural history, and prehistoric or historic archeology span uh, and planning. Um, and the list kind of goes on about what other kind of professional qualifications we need, uh, we, we could constitute that 40% makeup. Um, and then additionally with um, the federal guidelines uh, have certain requirements as well regarding um, that the, you know, the members have demonstrated interest in, uh, in knowledge and historic preservation um, as currently drafted. Uh, the section of our municipal code, which is Title II, Chapter 15, regarding the powers and duties and makeup of the commission, don't, don't quite speak to those uh, requirements. So that's something for consideration. Um, and then, um, in, as you all would recall from 2021, um, the draft ordinance goes on to set forth the procedures that the commit commission and then the city council would have um, in the designation of a, a landmark or a historic district. Um, so um, I'm here to address any questions or any uh, that, that are and the members of the commission have about the ordinance as it's currently drafted um, or to you know, kind of go over some of the, the comments that we had um, included in the, in the packet. Okay, um, so I see that uh, Melinda has her hand raised. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, give her the first opportunity for questions. Okay, yes, I uh, read through this uh, side by side comparing to our uh, final draft. Um, and uh, some of the, uh, the questions, um, uh, that we want uh, uh, city uh, departments involved in that. We, uh, it originally said uh, that the um, uh, applications would go to the community development department um, and uh, to us. So uh, I, I'm not sure why that was the question. Um, uh, a lot of what I uh, came up with was basically why. Uh, why do we scramble these things and uh, take them out of order? Um, for instance, now the designation hearing is before the uh, commission review of the application, um, which seems kind of backwards. Um, how easy is that to correct? Well, like I say, we had it the other way around originally. Victoria? Um, so the, the draft I had originally didn't include a designation hearing at all, um, but that can be something that we could revise. Maybe it's got the different draft then. Do you want to send uh, her what you have, Melinda, or send it to Eric and Eric sends it to her? I don't know. I, that would be appropriate. Professor. Uh, Eric did have it. Uh, but yes, I can certainly send our, what we we have called our final draft. And do a comparison. Which has been through uh, three, four different city attorneys. Yeah, well, uh, I, I think possibly more. Real fast, Melinda, point of order. <laughs> can you, um, can you uh, uh, just real fast, 
for the benefit of everybody reading along, uh, what section are you referring to on this? Um, the designation hearing, would that be section three? Um, yes. Okay. And can you, so let, let's read this so we can get it in, in into the, the record. Read this as, as it's written here. Um, and, or I could read it and then you can read what you have, um, in, and, and we can kind of talk about the difference. Cause I'm curious about this difference on, on this. I've, I've, I've seen a couple things in here that, you know, I do want to get clarification on, but um, if you want to go ahead and do that real fast, I'll read this and then you can read what, what yours states. But this isn't the only thing that Melinda found, right, Melinda? That, um, well, and for sake of time, isn't yeah, this in the record? As, isn't this in the record as part of the agenda rather that's than fair. reading things into the record? That's fair. No, no, good yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you have, you have valid point. It is part of the agenda, so uh, it is. Yeah. So just, uh, so, just because I'm, I'm interested to hear everything Melinda has to say. I just don't want to suck up time reading yeah. stuff uh, into yeah. the record that's in there. That's totally fair. And I, uh, I, I can see what the. I mean, what what is uh, perhaps called the designation hearing is what we call commission review. Um, and then our recommendations would uh, would go to the city council, actually, because uh, the actual designation has to have, at least the way we had it written, comes from city council. We only recommend designation. We don't have the power to actually designate. Well, if we become a CLG, that'd be a whole different story. That's well, and that would be the goal, but because uh... you've been using that word a lot, Victoria, CLG. Yeah. Well, there's advantages to being a CLG. Well, and there's also some challenges and people that don't want. Rules and regs really balk at yeah. CLGs. Well, and that I mean the our final draft was largely based on a, a format suggested by History Colorado is their template, right. um, and we just uh, tweaked it and added a few things. Hannah, do you know what we're talking about? You're on mute. You're muted. Um, I have it open. I'm reading. Yeah. And I read through it before. before no, but that. what a CLG is? I do not know and that. I'm it's a it's something that happens at the state level where they've encouraged I mean, local governments, i.e. the certified local government to be more. What would you say, Cash, to be more empowered to designate and protect? Um, historic sites in your area. And also eligible for grant money and things like that, that. Uh, yeah, it kind of opens up a floodgate of that. Yeah. We always have the assistance from the historic Colorado, but it's, yeah, I, it's a lot of I money mean, tied to it. <laughs> well, uh, Lauren is definitely the expert on this, not me, but it's it, it has a, a state and a federal component to it to be no, a certified local government. And you have to have certain language in your ordinance to do it and certain provisions in your ordinance to do it. Uh, but yeah, it, it opens up certain sources of funding. Like I said, Lauren is the expert on that. So it's, uh, I understand why she's not here, <laughs> but I wish she was. But yeah, it it has state and federal components. And yeah, I think it gives you a little more power than most probably municipalities have uh, for certain designations. But that's, yeah, that's my, my understanding of it, not being an expert in that. I mean, we tried the CLG route quite a few years ago, and that came crashing down. Um, but that was the council then. The council has changed to a certain degree its dynamics. Mm -hmm. So then the idea is, can CLGs be talked again? If we talk about it, are we putting it in the ordinance itself? Is that what you're thinking, Victoria? Yeah, that's required by, for the state and federal regulations to get that designation. Certain, certain language is required within the ordinance itself. That's wild, because we did it separately before. 
Um, yes, but it, from again, based off of the version I had, which I'm now understanding from Belinda's comments, that might not have been the final draft. Um, the the language is is mostly similar. Um, there, it seemed like it was mirrored off of what the the C, CLG model ordinance would have been. So it would be making the Historical Preservation Commission a certified local government to have more say so and funding to be able to do things. Well, it would it would it would effectively be making the city of Englewood as part of the certified local government program with both state and federal. Um, the um, one uh, well, city council always and correct me if I'm wrong on this, um, but uh, the city council would always have the all the absolute authority right. of the scenario because they are, of course, elected officials and, and they govern the community. Right. However, we would be the advisory commission, which have uh, which would have a lot of the powers and responsibilities to make decisions in which I believe some of them we can act upon ourselves as a commission. Most of them are recommendations to the council for final decision. Is that is that kind of the understanding and yeah, that, that's exactly correct. Um, it would, I mean, if, if you can think of like, for instance, the current planning and zoning commission and the, the role that it, it has within the city, um, there would be advisory opinions um, that would then be voted on with council. Um, but this would also allow the historic preservation commission the ability to um, have like design review of, um, of homes or, or, or buildings that have the landmark or the district designation. Um, to before that there were any um, like remodeling or potential demolition of those buildings that, that that those kind of plans would come before the commission for their review uh, and potential approval. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we'd uh, seen that in uh, City of Golden has uh, is a a CLG and has uh, a, a lot of those and they have a whole design review uh, process and uh, so forth and. Uh, have uh, get to approve or deny things so um, that we we kind of modeled after them uh, in a sense. So uh, forgive me to go back, Matt. Um, I'm curious, how can Melinda and Victoria work or exchange input? I mean, well, um, so in an, in an effort, I, so I would like to see at least the sections called out that are in question just to have that on record for our meeting this evening um so and maybe just a quick summary of it but i don't want to take a whole lot of time on that i just want to um kind of understand as 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 the commission here what what the discrepancies are um i i think once we kind of have this discussion once we're done this evening if melinda sends to eric and eric can then provide to um the a city attorney's office the the version that the latest version that we were aware of um, yep, i can i can do that okay thank you Eric. um so yeah melinda if you want to go ahead and just call out the sections um yeah i could say i am right now uh actually uh emailing matt to uh to eric oh very good okay. <laughs> poor eric he's the he's the funnel of all <laughs> <laughs> everything we do at these meetings so yeah but uh, yeah the uh um why why you do that melinda i i'm yeah uh performance the, uh, society and, and this is some of this is perhaps our uh um Things that we should have cleaned up. Uh, uh, I I noted that the uh, like uh, nomination uh, by a non-owner and there's a uh, another place that says uh, a non-owner uh, can only be it has to be the commission or a, a property owner can only nominate. So we need to clean that up in our own version. I think. Um, I wonder what was so offensive about the uh, 
Mark about stabilizing and improving property values by conserving historic properties. I cribbed that out of uh, Iowa City. Um, what section number is that? That's uh, right at the, the very beginning. Um, it was uh, paragraph four or A4. Okay. And um, then um, uh, the uh, I say the the pair the the section on a designation hearing we can call it that that's uh, um, fine but uh, I think. Uh, uh, Commission review should come ahead of that. Um, wow. And um, let's see where they. It, we did uh, discuss uh, also the uh, 215, uh, but not in, in this because we were told that was going to be a separate thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I got uh, interrupted or disgusted before I got to uh, wrote some of these comments, but um, I, I would point out we do, uh, the commission does have a form. We we designed that some time ago. We've just uh, have not had the authority to designate anything. We, um, yeah. Yeah. And a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do have like the landmark application and stuff ready to go. So. Yeah. Did, Victoria, did you know about that? Does that even matter? Um, I, I, I think I have a copy of the, the form. Um, I think my question is just more related to who should be reviewing it, the commissioner staff. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Melinda, but um, in, in our discussions, I believe that it was um, initially the applications were sent to community development um, and community development's role in that was simply to just to make sure the application was filled out in, in its entirety and accurately, um, but not actually make a recommendation. And then it would go to the commission for discussion, recommendation, proceedings to go from there. Yes. Now, and then after the commission made their final decision, then it, then mm -hmm. the recommendation or, or the advisory would be sent to um, city council and then city council would, would proceed through their process acting upon our 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 recommendation, yes. And that's where I brought up the idea that developers are going to be really ornery about this because I would stretch it out at least three months. Well, um, you know, keep in mind that the, I mean, there, there's no hiding behind the fact that the, the main purpose for doing this and doing this as soon as possible to there is there are, there are people in the community that um, are in a situation where they may have lived in a home for 30, 40, 50 years um and they would like their home to be saved for the future generations There's a lot of beautiful homes mm -hmm. that, along those lines and they 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 feel as if they if they sell right now the only people that will buy most most of the homes in inglewood the traditional homes in inglewood will be a developer and it would get torn down um and this is i i predict and i could be wrong on this but i predict that a large percentage of the people that will fill these out are people that have a love and care for their homes. Um, there was a, a couple mm -hmm. that we met at the uh, block party, um, and uh, um, she said, "I one of the saddest things was seeing the home that I was born in torn down just a couple weeks ago." And um, if you know, and and she said, "I was, you know, I was born right on the steps there in the, the front porch, um, you know, heading out to the. Apparently, her parents were heading to the hospital, and 
And she said that uh, she would have loved to seen that home saved, but the only people that had the power, well, and of course that's the thing, developers have a louder voice than most people that, that, that you know, are looking at buying the, these types of homes, these smaller type of homes. But uh, anyway, a developer came in and, and was able to outbid everybody else and tore, the, tore it down. And she said it was very sad to see. Um, there's another aspect associated with this, and that is that um, there's an opportunity to maintain um, affordable housing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, listen, I, you know, my house, just like every other Englewood 1920s bungalow, uh, it was intended to be a starter home. It was, it was, um, I, I loved Englewood so much, though I never moved. Um, but there's, there's a lot of people that are looking for owning a home. And, these more cost-effective homes are being replaced with with things that are not, and so this 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 plays into that. Um, and then, you know, I mean, we're not we're not intending on stopping developers. We're just intending on on giving a voice and an opportunity to those that live in this community, um, a way to preserve something that they that they feel strongly about. And I I firmly believe that a lot of people that will buy into these structures afterwards. I mean, CJ, you can talk about. Arapahoe Acres in this in this case is probably more of a more of an argument in in case of Arapahoe Acres people are seeking the, those types of homes right now they are entirely in style yet given the opportunity a developer would take that opportunity to tear it down and build something bigger because it would provide them more more you know mm -hmm. bottom line or just, I should say so and charge twice what the single family home would have uh, cost somebody yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, the reality is here is that this this is not this is not an attack on developers. This is this is an opportunity to preserve what we call community in Inglewood again, and and really, you know, at least save part of it for the future, so we don't have a you know Cherry Creek situation on our hands, right? So, mm. I'll get off my soapbox. No, but it's so true. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so anyway. Um, that said, that's kind of the background on this um, um, as, as a whole. But um, Melinda, um, do you have anything else to to call out on this? That was uh, main. I mean, my main question was why. <laughs> that are you? Well, know, I mean, if she is... doesn't get it, I mean, the idea is that just go over it with Eric, I guess, or somebody, and yeah, just make sure that that is the correct thing that Victoria has. That's all. Yeah, and, and I mean, and I would, if we went, I understood they were going to move it all into like a section 12. It was all the, uh, that in combined the uh, 215 and uh, and this, uh, fine. You know, I had no problem with that. Okay. And, you know, if that means renumbering things, but uh, otherwise, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Well, but the whole thing is being fixed. And so it may not be. Broke, well, that's it's it's been, been we've fixed. been waiting so many years to yeah, try to get this melding. in front of council. Yeah, um, but we're melding in now with the evolution of what's going on. I mean, at least we're in, at least yeah. we're involved, right? So let me, uh, let me, let me ask Cash. Um, Cash, you were very involved in, in, and the, the wording of this and i'd like to get your opinion or comments yeah and jason was too i know because i it's been long enough that i can't remember all the sources that we drew off of but i know we picked and chose from some other cities ordinances to put this together um i well, I, I the things melinda said i i agree with generally i guess if you know it, it if it gets us where we want to go, I'm not terribly concerned about really specific language, and I don't have any pride of authorship, either myself or this commission, if we get it, if we get it to where it needs to be. I, I guess that's a preamble to asking you, Victoria, this question. So the, the changes that are in here, is this based off of some model ordinance? What, what drove the changes that are in here? Maybe if you explain that, that'll help us yeah, understand absolutely. a little bit better. Absolutely. Um, so everything in red was from 2021, that the changes that were previously suggested. Um, and um, based off of the track changes I have, that was from Kendra Carberry. And also the former deputy city attorney, Duden 
uh, Comer. Uh, what's in blue um, is what our office is currently suggesting to include, and that is based off of the um, Colorado um, the Colorado Certified Local Government Pre Preservation Ordinance Guide. Okay. Got it. And I, mean, I, I, I wonder if that guide or that that model ordinance has come out since we drafted this, if it's more recent than when we worked on this, which is uh, probably the case would be my guess. I don't, um, I don't so, think so. I think it's always been there, Cash. It's just that we were kind of staying know. away from CLG for a while. Yeah. And well, again, Lauren would know that for sure. I don't I don't know all the ins and outs of that. But yeah, I mean, Matt, I, I, overall, I. I don't have the have a problem with it. Um, it. It like I said, I to me, I think it it accomplishes our our goals. Generally speaking, is how I read it. Okay, and and if I can, I, I wanted to address the issue about the designation hearing and commission review. Yeah. Um, the idea was that the commission that the hearing would take this public hearing would take place before the commission, and then the commission would be issuing its decision based off of the information provided at the hearing and that the application that was yeah right yeah because no, sorry to interrupt you sorry oh no no, no. That, that that was just the idea it wasn't that um to to get away from the commission's decision itself, but we, we, the idea just to not have the commission be prejudging before it received all the evidence. Yeah, because I think I think the commission, as this is drafted now, I understand the addition of the designation hearing section to lay out the time frame for doing that. The commission review section is, and again, I think this is a product of trying to mesh a bunch of different things together. I Correct me if I'm wrong, Victoria. I think what the commission review section now is saying, and maybe it needs a different title for the section, is these are the criteria or these are the steps the commission has to follow in reviewing the application following the hearing. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's more... I'm I see your point about maybe changing what it's called from commission review. It's more like commission decision. Um, yeah. and there is a sections later on uh, within this regarding what criteria would be assessed um, and, and whether or not to meet the designation or to revoke the designation, um, yeah. depending on, on the circumstances. But um, can I jump in here real fast? Um, please. Do you mind cash? Yeah, yeah, no, please, please. Yeah. Those were my oh. those were my general thoughts anyway. Yeah. So and, and this also be a question for Victoria on this with the designation hearing, because this is one of the spots that, that kind of caught me too, is is it, it seems as if the uh well, okay. So first off, it seems that the city council would be the one scheduling the public hearing. Is is that or or would that actually be the commission scheduling the public hearing? The first, um, the designation hearing would be scheduled before the commission, and it would involve the commission schedule. Uh, okay. Yeah, your body. So it wouldn't necessarily be. So we would we would control that. Um, I guess I misunderstood then than than that portion of it. So yeah. I, I read that. I read that Matt as being like a similar to a planning and zoning commission hearing, in that it would be a commission hearing scheduled by the commission. Okay. So I I would like. I mean, obviously it would. It would be preferable if we didn't involve, for instance, the Planning and Zoning Commission or the Board of Adjustments and Appeals or City Council in these early stages, and rather um, we would uh, um, uh, we would we would be able to schedule the commission. So that sounds like that's the direction. Now, for us to do that, does that then make us a quasi-judicial type of entity? And and um, and I guess I see from the, the, the wording here in comment VM2 um, that, that that kind of applies to that. I just wanted to verify. And that was an objection that council had previously, that uh, if we were scheduling hearings, we'd be a quasi-judicial body. And plus adding an extra hearing in there just uh, slows the process down. Well, Victoria, what's your position on this? Because um, I mean, our, our office's recommendation on that would be to include the hearing so that we are in, ensuring um, the due process rights of property of interest holders. Sure. 
Because and I and I agree with that because if if we don't uh, if we don't have the ability to schedule the public hearing in the initial stages of it, um, then we we don't have the actual authority with with I guess judging the uh, historic character, historic importance, or the, the actual position of the that's being presented. Um, we we are simply a kind of a second or third party to to that information, and we. It would be advisable if we could actually hold that public hearing. Now, of course, I understand the challenges with that. Maybe if we can have a good reason to present to council as us being quasi judicial, um, that I don't know. My my personal opinion on that, my personal vote would be to be that. But I see cash is unmuted, so cash is good. Yeah, and I <laughs> yeah with with the caveat that I do not know the legal answer to this question, and I'm not providing legal advice about it. I think because it's structured such that we're making a recommendation that council's free to accept or reject, even though it's requiring a hearing. I think that is something different than. I don't think we're quasi judicial. I don't. I think that's something different than the board of uh, the BAA or the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, I think their structure is different than that. I mean, uh, understanding council can overturn the Board of Adjustment and Appeals. I don't know that for sure, but understanding council can overturn like a zoning decision. I don't think those are put to council in the vein of recommendations i think that's the difference well i i as i understand um the 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 boaa is a is a special entity because they they do yes in their own in their own realm and that's I right their their decisions can only be appealed to uh, a Rambo county uh court um and or right probably the attorney office there i guess victoria help me out on this one yeah <laughs> Yeah, and, and I mean that with respect to the VOA, yeah, I believe that's correct. And I, again, I don't have it all in front of me. Um, with planning and zoning, that they are still a quasi-judicial body um, when they are, for instance, you know, looking over a, a planned a unit development application. Although their decision isn't final, it's a recommendation. They by holding the public hearing, um, they are that that does that's what makes them quasi-judicial. Even even though council still does have the final, um, I guess. Uh, approval right yeah so maybe this i mean then the answer to that maybe is i mean victoria you tell me it, does this make us quasi-judicial just by the fact that we're by virtue of the fact that we're having a public hearing the way this is structured uh, yes it, it it would um it, it would it would, it would um, yes <laughs> is the short yeah. answer to the question I mean, so I, your concern, Matt and Melinda, both of your concern is well taken because council did push back on that before. So I understand that. I, my, my, my comment, I guess, is I, being a quasi-judicial board is not that big of a deal is I, I suppose how I would put it, or at least I don't see it that way. Because again, it's council free to accept or reject recommendations. And I think to have this process, whether it's CLG or not, I think you have to have hearings about this. So if council actually wants to make this process real and give us any any power to do anything, including making recommendations, it seems to me it has to include a hearing. So uh, I, I guess it's a long way of saying, I, I think to get any of the changes we want through, whether it's CLG or something short of that, I think council has to come around to the idea that, okay, yes, it is quasi-judicial, but to me, so what, right? Um, I mean, if we have a good reason for this and, and the process seems to make sense with, with the order, kind of order of operation with this, we could go back. It's also been a while since, since we've, we've had this discussion. With yes. Um, time, uh, time heals all wounds of sorts, right? I mean, over time, uh, think, you know, new ideas come, come up and, uh, for council. some of us remember Greg forever, you know. <laughs> uh, sure. But uh, um, I think there's been, I think there's actually new council members since uh, since we last presented. Um, oh, for sure. I think there's several since we last presented this, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'll throw out that idea. This is still a draft. I mean, 
let's throw it out there, shoot for the stars and see if we reach any. And if we don't, maybe we just reach the top of a mountaintop. You we, know? Have, we have the best intents and intent in mind with this. Um, and if we can back up, you know, the, the things that we, the way that we'd like the process to work, then we just simply have to make that argument to council. Um, I, I believe the though the first things first thing being first here is getting Melinda um, and uh, you know Melinda's document connected with Victoria and then do the comparison between the two. Um, I do I do see this as another conversation, although um, I am grateful in the fact that there's a, a very high likelihood that the next conversation on this will be with. Victoria again, and not a, another city attorney. Um, it seemed like the last time we were doing this. Every single time we we uh, we'd schedule one of these discussions with the city attorney, it'd be somebody different um, that had their own opinion on the matter. So. Well, and what I mean, if I can bring out Victoria, you bringing in the CLG is exactly what we kind of wanted in the first place. So the idea of melding it all together, yeah. I think. Number one, thank you for your work. Number two, keep going. <laughs> Cheers on. And I appreciate that. And, and, and I mean, to be fair, I mean, we want to make sure we're getting the direction from your commission as we as this advances. Um, so if if the direction is not to go CLG or or whatever, you know, we just want to make sure that we're working with you uh, in doing this process. I say go CLG. And and from that standpoint, that would no matter no matter how the official designation towards the CLG adoption process would go, if it, if there's a resistance to it or if there's an acceptance to it now, at least the framework has been well vetted for what this process looks like, and that and and we would we would be compatible with it if that time were to come. Yeah, the ordinance is only part of being a CLG. There are other uh, steps, I mean, an inventory, for instance, of uh, our historic. Uh, there are other things that are required before you're a CLG. So, is, but, uh, yeah, the ordinance that's, that's as, a, it, as it currently stands gives us actually no powers. Yeah, um, that's a uh, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a great point, Melinda. Because it, this is even what we're proposing here is just an ordinance that doesn't automatically make us a CLG by virtue right. of passing this ordinance. And so, I think the ordinance, the, the outlines of the way this is structured, and you know, this is obviously sort of Frankenstein at this point with all the <laughs> all the pieces that have been molded together. But I think it does capture our purpose, and it it would if we wanted to move toward being a CLG, it would be the, it would be the type of ordinance that would be required to do that. So it would, it would give us the groundwork to do that. And I think at this point, I mean, we keep working, Matt, you know, well said, everything that you said, it's, I think, another conversation. And, you know, with changes on council and how long it's been and all that, you know, present an ordinance that looks something like what we're talking about here to council. And if council says no way, then, I suppose we go back to the drawing board, but short of this, I don't see it as much different than the current ordinance, which doesn't spell out a process or give us much real authority to do anything. So it seems to me a proposal like this, understanding there's going to be some further conversation refinement is what we need to move forward and present to council again. And as I guess as part of the overall municipal code rewrite that's going on and if they if they say no way then i suppose we we take it from there and and do what we can but you know it seems it seems we should go at least this far in what we're trying to get them to pass if we're going to go through the effort at this point yeah, yeah. hannah you had a question do um is historic denver are they a clg Um, I'm not sure on that, Melinda. You're 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 nodding your head. Is that? <laughs> yes, they are. Um, so they, do we have anybody we can reach out to? I I only ask because they walk through um, multiple places, and I and I watch them, and I got to see them really take. I think there's like five of them that won the awards, but anyway, they walked through, and they had a really strong say in what happens, and they were looking 
structurally, you know, um, mm -hmm. with what we would recreate, with what we kept with and everything. And then, so while you guys were speaking and I was reading it, I don't know if we should look over maybe what they have or, or what they did to be able to, to use that in what we're trying to do. If that's even a possibility, I don't, I'm new at this, but. Do it some of what and actually they have volunteered to share it uh in a couple of years ago for instance their uh system for uh using volunteers and so forth to uh create an inventory and uh, collect information about neighborhoods and so forth uh and they had a all, all we need is like little tablet computers and they'd share the the software with us um and that is so that's you know they're very generous about that but then they're they've been doing it a longer a much longer while um i can put out also uh we got the um the ordinance from um uh, uh, city of golden and uh okay. some of their stuff which is uh uh really very interesting and how they the kind of approvals that they have and uh they're a clg um and they're they're closer to the same size of city that we are um i mean denver's got uh, a whole lot more people and more resources uh so yeah. we, we I, looked I, a lot uh didn't we cash it uh, golden was a big one i want and i want to say i want to say there's like the number 67 sticks out in my mind. I think there's 67 certified local governments in Colorado and you can Google it and find out. It's, I think it's on History Caro's yeah, website. No, but, fact, I think I might still have it. Uh, that yeah, Lauren uh, provided it, us a list it, or it was. And it's a, it's a lot of cities surrounding us like Denver, Lakewood, Aurora, Littleton. I know those are all golden. Those are all CLGs, mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, and um, and small places, uh, things like Carbondale, mm -hmm. and um, you know that uh, even small towns uh, can do it. So it just well, and, yeah, I know. I agree to it. Yeah, no, and I I know Jason talked about this at some length. He he was also I I would consider him to be an expert in the in the subject matter area as well. But yeah. I know even some some places where there was initial political resistance to it. it it was it was passed and 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 but you know it was it was by acclaim sort of you know everyone everyone saw the benefit to it and so it's been done in some places where there was some initial resistance to it so, mm -hmm. so according to uh historycolorado.org um your memory is very good um cash uh 67 um uh, uh certified local governments in colorado um, there are 127 local governments with preservation ordinances. Um, Which I guess we're technically one of those because we have an ordinance. That is correct. Place. <laughs> that, and, and arguably, I think, yeah, well, the ordinance had never been actually act, acted upon prior to our right. existence. And even during our existence, it technically hasn't been acted upon, which is a very strange situation. But um, Anyway, I think uh, I think we're getting in the right direction here. Um, this is going there's going to be a discussion here moving forward again. I think um, and uh, maybe uh, I don't know if, uh, next month, Eric, scheduling wise, next month we can kind of pick this up again. Um, and during that, between now and then, um, Melinda's version um, can be compared against the city's current red line. And then we can have a, have another working session associated. Um, does that seem to make sense at this point? Um, yeah, I wanted to have uh, Brian chime in for about kind of talk about the timing between the Title 16 rewrite and when it's going to be going before council and, and whatnot. Okay. Yeah. So um, what we presented to council Monday Tuesday night was that we were going to bring this item along with two other chapters which are the remaining three chapters of the UDC to council on February 27th. So if the goal is to get there, then we need to make sure we're through this ordinance by the next meeting. And I was gonna to talk to Eric about likely holding maybe a special meeting earlier than 
the the odds would be the 15th of February to be able to review this and just maybe have this the only item on the agenda so we can go through it and get it done so that we can take that recommendation to council. Okay. Um, well, uh, how does everybody's schedule look? Um, the only day that is out of the question for me would be on our normal Wednesdays would be um, February 1st. I've got a commitment that night, um, but we can do for that matter. Um, I don't know if we want to call out a couple dates here that, that, that may work. We can don't have to do it on a Wednesday. If it's a special meeting, we can do it whenever we want. Like just, just as though there's enough notice provided. And the other half of this is to make sure we give Vicki enough time to get through any updates to the ordinance. I don't want to put her on a really rush timeline either. Yeah, fair, very, very fair. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's a very good point. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, the 8th is OK, but I'm I'm happy to look at any date in the first week or 10 days of February to do a special meeting to try to push it to the finish line. Victoria, how long how long do you need to um, for review of this to go, you know, comfortably compare what Melinda has um, and what the current red line is? Um, I mean, if, if the meeting were scheduled uh, early in February, I would have I would have plenty of time. Um, Eric has already forwarded me what um, Melinda uh, forwarded to him, so I, I already have that in my, to, to look off of. Very I good. can get started on that later this week. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, well, then in that case, we can if we can assume uh, sometime early February, and and that would be that would consist of you know either the second or third, um, sixth, seventh, eighth. We probably don't want to go much further than that because we'll have the meeting in the next week. And it'd be nice to have um, whenever we have this next session, this full working session, to have, have the full review over this. And it, it'd be one of those scenarios where at that end of the meeting, we, we have everything, which I don't think would be difficult to get to, but we, it's, it's kind of speak now or forever, hold your peace. And then by the 15th, um that's when we would vote on it as a commission is this this is this is we this is what we agree and this is what we'd like to present um does that work well with your timing brian to to have a final decision where we actually vote as a commission on, on the 15th yeah so what we have to do is if our, our study session with council is on the 27th we generally try to get everything done about a week ahead of time so my due dates for myself for the 20th so if y'all had to vote on the 15th, um, I think I can present that draft that way. Okay. And, and the nice thing about this process is, that is so we've, we've kind of primed the conversation. We've, we've gotten back up to speed with this. It's been a long time since we've looked at it. So now the 8th, we really dig in. And then the 15th, uh, we have that kind of opportunity there thinking between the 8th and the 15th or the week, that week, sometime within that week to the 15th. Yeah. Any anything final that we would want adjusted. It's kind of like call it a first reading and second reading. So we have to have a study session. So may I throw out uh, February 1st, 2nd, or 6th? I cannot do the first. I'm going to I'm gonna hop in and veto the 6th because I got stuff going to city council that night. OK. And I got to veto the 1st because I. All right, so that leaves Groundhog Day the 2nd. Second, seventh, or eighth. Does it work for everybody? Second, second, seventh, yeah. or eighth, Matt. Groundhog Day seems kind of appropriate, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, as second, seventh, or eighth, any of those are fine for me. Um, <laughs> so seven thirty, you said six, six, six thirty. I'm oh. sorry, Hannah. Uh, go ahead. I can do the second. I can't do this. Yay! The so we've got it. Do you want to go Thursday, to second? February 2nd. <coughs> Thursday, February 2nd. Everybody and, ready? and uh that actually gives us more time if if in the event we and what time? 6:30? Um, I, I think 6:30 works well. Um that gives everybody an opportunity to get home from work, right? 
Does that work for everybody? It's fine with me. Yep. That works. Um, if in the event we we come to a stalemate at a, on a second, we have the following week. We can have another meeting if if necessary to hopefully that doesn't have to happen. Um, we're going to zoom it, right? We will zoom it. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, Eric, I don't think then, we'll, yeah. would we have to vote on this? Yeah. So yeah, I need a motion of the second from the special. So move that we meet um, for study session regarding the ordinances um, on Thursday, February 2nd, 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. I'll second. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion on this? Not hearing any. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, motion carries. Meeting will be on Thursday, February 2nd at 6.30 p.m. And uh, I will get you, Eric, I will set a reminder to get you the agenda by next week, 25th. Hey, is there any way to look at this thing without the reds and the blues and everything? <laughs> reds and blues. Yeah, do we need that? To see you have to accept the out. changes. Oh. Yeah, or or I, Eric, I don't mean to give you another thing to do, but uh, if it goes back around, maybe like a clean version along with the red line. Yeah, sure. I think that's doable. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard for me to concentrate. Yeah, I was getting kind of cross-eyed myself. <laughs> that... Yeah, that would be good. That would... Uh, appreciate that. Um, Guys, we're going for ordinance. Yes, we yes, are. Yes. And, and and I have to say, I mean, honestly, and, and all jokes aside in this, the amount of city attorneys that have looked at this is a lot. And the fact that we made it through and, and city attorneys are probably a lot like engineers. They all have their own opinion on things. Um, and uh, the fact that we've made it this far with the information that we have, it, this is just we, we got to Polish the corners on this. I mean, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's definitely look Matt at the T's engineer. and the I's and, and <laughs> yeah. make sure but, what we're giving. But the fact that we've had so many city attorneys look at this, I mean, and that we've made it this far through it, and and a, a large percentage of the 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 information <laughs> still exists in there is pretty impressive. Um, Victoria, I don't I don't know if, if if you know the history, but there was a period of time where um, just about every month. Um, it was about every month, I think, that the city had a new city attorney that was acting. Um, I, I know Dugan, had, had, I think he's, he, he stuck around for a long time. He was assistant. But um, there was there was definitely a period of time where every time we had this discussion, it was a different person. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you very much, um, Victoria, for um, taking the time this evening. And we look forward to seeing you on Thursday, February 2nd, uh, for a working session dedicated to this. Does she have to be here for February 2nd? Isn't that just us? Um, no, I, I believe I believe it would be good for you to be to be present to, to talk about the changes and um, any other wording. Hmm. The 15th might be just us. But... That's what I was thinking, was the 15th would be the polishing. No, I think the fifteenth will be the final decision. Okay, the, okay. the second will be the polishing. All right, I got. Yeah, it. I mean, if it, Victoria, hopefully, if it hopefully if it goes as planned, the fifteenth will just be a vote. There won't be a ton more discussion on it at that point, right? I mean, that that would be my expectation, um, and certainly the goal. And that would be my preference if I'm having to get this thing ready to present to council at a study session the week after that. All right, thanks. And if, if I may just while you're all together, um, I, I am looking at the version Melinda sent over. So the, the last version I had was uh, from May 12th, 2021. That's what was submitted to council. Um, yeah, I, I, if, Melinda, do you know when the version you had was, was last um, worked on? Was it after May 12th, 2021? And I, I apologize, I know it's hard to can point a date on something like that. I just wasn't sure if you can tell based off of um, how it's saved.
That's you looking it up, right, Melinda? <laughs> You're muted. Well, December 2020. Okay. So, so what's the May 21? That, that's May 12, 2021. 20, yeah, I can't speak. May 12, 2021 is what went to council. Um, and that was the, the last version my office had that I worked off of. So it sounds like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if the version that Melinda sent over was from 2020, um, some significant changes were made within that year by other city attorneys. <laughs> and um, that, um, I believe it's the same. Am I muted again? No. I believe it's the same one. What I have that is from May of 2021 was our. Um, um our agenda and our uh, <clears throat> the uh assessment report um and those were yeah options to consider for code updates and we had a yeah we had a special meeting in May of 2021 to present this to council right on May 17 2021 yeah and the May 12 2021 version was attached to that May 17 2021 council communication is that right yes although there we did not we did not modify it in uh, uh, in that meeting. We were just, um, or we were doing the final review of that December 2021. Well, just so I'm clear, uh, yeah. the, the final version that our office should currently be working on is that the version that was submitted to council on May 17th, 2021, which is the yes. 12th version. Yes. Okay, so then the version that you sent to Eric that's from 2020, that's not what I should be looking at. Is that correct? No, that is, that is the, uh, should be the same version. It's, I know, I, I've just been checking. I don't have a later version. Um. I, can, I, I can follow up with you outside of the meeting. I just, I just want to make sure that I have the, what is actually the last version and yeah. I'll, I'll um, um, contact you about what the final council communication was um, so you can take a look at we can both take a look at that and this version you sent over um, to Eric because they're, they're not the same um, yeah the last the last version I had was the one that Dugan had made a bunch of changes to and that was prior to that May public uh, working session with council or study session and i i think that was the one where they the big uh quasi-judicial um discussion uh went on and we went back and said no we're sticking with what we've got but no i just check and i and that is the latest version that I have. I'm trying to look back here and see what, see what my version is. I, if I recall correctly, um, there was a long time between us finalizing our wording, the various city managers, city attorneys, and then actually getting time before council. And we did try taking it to council um, and say in well, to uh, do an end run around for a, approval of this so we could get going on a bunch of things uh, rather than wait for the uh, whole uh, rewrite process. And uh, that was denied. Right. So we were, we had uh, like another year to wait. Um, um, Cash, do you have any record that we could we can kind of validate here with the revisioning. I might not in front of me. 
but I can take a look at that before the special session. I just want to. I just want to make sure, and, I, and I'm sure Victoria's going in the same direction. I just want to absolutely make sure that we are looking at the right one. It, it, it's been a long time since we looked at this. Melinda, I'm sure you have the right one. I'm not saying you don't. Just would like a, a further verification to say, hey, we've got two people that are looking at the same thing here. <laughs> what happened? Um, you know, something changed here that we may not have been aware of, actually. That, um, yeah, I'm thinking the May 2021 version was maybe something done by the city attorney, um, but not uh, with our agreement. I don't know. And, and, and we don't need to go down there because we have the opportunity right now. I'm, I'm, yeah. grateful, I'm grateful that we have, you know, the same people now involved in this and we can, we can have this, this discussion. I just want to absolutely make sure that we have the right version that we are referencing. Um, and I, I'm having trouble finding it myself. So I will look, but Cash, um, maybe if you could look too. And yeah, I, I will look. Um, I can't guarantee that I'll have anything that'll shed light on it, but I'll try. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, when can we get back to Victoria ahead of our meeting on the second with confirmation of that? Do you think we give, do we give it to, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good information in Melinda's document that needs to be validated against what, what is currently redlined. Um, but Cash, what do you think? It, would, it, would it be okay to maybe uh, report in a couple of days from now and i'll do the same yeah this this week this week is it's fine i'll know if i have anything different than that this week but yeah okay well and i'll do the same so what is it wednesday yes yeah, wednesday um by the end of the week i'll report into eric and say there's what i found couldn't buy it whatever um and uh yeah so if that if that works then that'll give time here just as a, just as a cross check Sounds good. Okay, cool. Ah. Uh, yes. Go ahead, Melinda. <laughs> I, was that right? Was that you raising your hand? Ah. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> um. I um. This was um. Uh, yeah. I just found it was attached to an email. And uh. It's uh, Dugan's uh, uh, Dugan's draft, and it was from July of 2021. Which may be the one that uh, May, June, July. So that was that was uh, after. That that's the one that you had sent to Eric, Melinda. Uh, no. Um, this is some of the the things that um, they say revised draft taking our the city council member concerns, as well as some language from city of Golden. Um, and. I don't think I had that in my. Uh... I'll oh, forward oh. this email to Eric. Yeah, if we could all just do a little homework and research on this. Um, that yeah. We don't need to do it right now with the uh, work workshop on this. Um, Brian, I see you pop in here with the. Well, and I'm watching the meeting from May 17th, 2021, and there's somebody from your commission named Jason O'Brien giving the presentation. Yes. So. Yep. I'm leaning in the direction of Vicki that that was the draft that was presented that night is the draft that Vicki has and that she's been working off of that your commission was aware of because one of your commission members was there presenting the item to council. So. And I think it's actually the same one we just did uh, uh, hit the accept the changes so we could uh, 
read it, but it is Jason's. Uh... And Jason did have this. Um, the, the the last city attorney to look at that, he had a discussion separately from our commission with the city attorney. Um, and now that you say I, that, I remember that too. Yeah, I just remember that also. So maybe but it could have been, I mean, when we talk about a linear, you know, doing one thing before another thing or whatever, we can, that could be part of our look at, part of our study session. Um, I like that idea, CJ. I, we... I say, let's go with what Vicki has or Victoria has. And then let's just talk about it and not concentrate on what was. Let's just say what we need to do to move it forward. Hey, it's fresh okay. eyes, fresh eyes looking on it, looking at it after exactly I'm looking at it for yeah. two years. Exactly. Because I do remember specifically that Jason meant with yeah. that lawyer. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So that that being said, I mean, if if anybody finds any other revisions of this document that that could be pertinent for discussion, let's 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 continue down that path but um to your point cj i like that let's let's just look at this again and go from there thank you for researching that brian thank you no problem um and eric you're okay with uh potentially getting uh, a few other things documents presented to you to get around to the rest of the group yeah not a problem Cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, any other discussion on this topic? Yay, not hearing any. That's, I think it's time to move on. Victoria, thank you for taking the time tonight. Um, looking forward to seeing you on the second and talking about this further. Absolutely. And thank you for helping me with the, those questions. Okay. Very good. Okay. And don't forget your caffeine, Vicki. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Very long night. Uh, is that what you're applying, CJ? I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, moving on to the next agenda item, which is getting back to the agenda here. Um, darn it. Staff's choice. Um, Eric, do you have anything to report? Uh, just one quick update. Um, I was this is circling back to the opinion um, historic survey. Um, I was able to reach out to them and just got their some background data that me and the long range planner are going to use to put together some maps to go with that document for when we go in front of council. There is awesome. some leg, there is some legwork that I need to do because some of the Excel fields are missing that we need to be able to create you know, those, those fun looking maps. So I do need to do some legwork there, um, but it is in the process. Oh, that's fantastic. So um, background on this, and I'm sure this is what you're um, referencing is that uh, city manager Lewis had uh, uh, made mention that the opinion survey was fantastic and it's in its majority, um, but would like to see recommendations on individual areas and other data pulled out of the report. So that's, I believe what you're referring to, yes? Yep. Awesome. Cool. And I'm I'm excited to see that. And I'm, I'm sure um, city manager's office will be also. Um, and uh, we'll have to see what, what comes up and what the next steps are after that. And that is it for me. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner's choice. Um, I'll go ahead and start and remind everybody that uh, the Inglewood Historic Preservation Society will be uh, having a talk. And who, who are they? Who are they? Uh, I'm Mr. sorry, Mr. Historic Mr. Inglewood. Historic <laughs> Inglewood. Uh, that, that's that's an old habit. We're still in the process of changing the logo anyway, so um, either one works. But Historic Inglewood is uh, holding a lecture on Tuesday, January 31st of 2023. Uh, there'll be two times, 2.30 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. Um, uh, the... Uh, uh, lectures will be at the Mayflower Church and is about the history of the Mayflower Church. Um, it's pre presented by David Gilbert, um, which uh, I believe a number of you may know from um, their, you know, I, I believe, well, I guess there's, there's a lot of involvement with the local newspaper with the Gilbert family and a lot of history and a lot of involvement with the Gilbert family. So um, anyway. Well, David did a great lecture on the Alexander Aircraft fire. Yes. Um, some years ago, yeah. That was a very good presentation. So he'll be doing the history of the Mayflower Church. So 
Tuesday, January 31st, 2023, 2.30 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. Um, would, would love to see you all there. Will that be recorded and on some sort of website? Well, we're still working on that. Um, so the answer is no for this one? We're going to try. Oh, uh, cool. I can't I can't commit to it working, um, but we will we'll do what we can. So. Cool. All right. Um, let's see what else. Uh, very sad news um, for those of you. Um, well, we, we lost. Um, first of all, Tammy Deegis, which was a member of the um, Historic Society for um very long time um she was one of the early members um she passed um uh, in december and um just last week um dave pascal um he uh he passed last uh, last week so two two sad things to report for those that knew um either dave or or tammy so cj you knew dave right yeah i didn't i met him once but what a neat guy yeah, very neat guy. Uh, interesting history with Dave Pascal is that he was the one uh, largely behind the preservation of the depot. Um, the depot was slated for demolition. The Inglewood Depot was slated for demolition when the uh, light rail was coming through. Um, and he was instrumental in the planning and organization of physically moving it and saving it. So uh, his work with that was um, obviously very great. Is there any chance you can pass that information on to the current depot owner? Um, I think it has been. Um, okay, uh, good. So, um, but yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's all I have. Um, if, uh, let's see, it's Cash, uh, do you have anything to report? I do not, thanks. Okay, um, Melinda? Nothing, thanks. Um, CJ. Oh, uh, one we met a gentleman in his 80s that was a plumber here in Arapaho Acres, and mm -hmm. he even worked with Bill Smith. Um uh, Bill Smith plumbing. The, the Bill Smith plumbing on Broadway. And so we're we're hoping to do a video re history, what do you call that? Oral history yeah. recording of him and because what he explained was different than some of the things we had understood because you kind of take history and kind of make the pieces fit and sometimes they don't. And so um, I'm really looking forward to that. That's really exciting. I even um, had him connect with Doug um, Cone of the society, um, but I, he's not going to be a good speaker, but it might be a great video when we finish it. So there we go. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, Hannah? Um, I don't have anything. Um, as always, I just learn more and more when I, when I join in. So thank you. Cool. Well, appreciate you. Appreciate everybody taking the time to, to do this. It's really neat to, uh, I don't know. It's just, this has grown into obviously a neat organization and uh i once uh ti the title 16 or whatever it's going to be title two or whatever they're calling <laughs> it now uh once that's passed um that'll be uh that'll be even more exciting because that'll that'll be the that'll be the next step next step in this mission after seven years we'll finally be real <laughs> <laughs> hey we're buy real your lottery ticket buy your lottery <laughs> ticket <laughs> we're, we're real we're, we're we're really sitting here we're really talking yeah. about stuff yeah <laughs> I move that the meeting be adjourned. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Thank you all. Uh, time is 8.49. Just turned over 8.49. Well, do we all agree? Uh, do we have to vote? I guess we have to vote. I, I, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Good night. Time is 8.49 p.m. All right. Good night. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Matt. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Eric. Thanks. Goodbye. Take care. Bye.